Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. What's up, everybody? Brian Parker back as your host for today's show. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a completely different look at appearance and performance enhancing substances. When we are out there on the road for our All Me Assembly programs, one of the things that we educate on is where these substances are coming from. A lot of people are surprised to learn that a good bit of things like anabolic steroids that are being used outside of proper medical guidance are actually being made on the black market. The typical process is that raw materials are being sourced from overseas. Then they're taking and being manufactured in unsanitary underground labs all across the continent. While we've talked a bit about this process before on the show, today we actually want to dive into the world of those trying to shut down that illegal process. So that's why we're going to be talking with former DEA Special Agent Bob Harkins. Bob was a part of the largest performance-enhancing drug crackdown effort in U.S. history known as Operation Raw Deal. Operation Raw Deal was an 18-month effort. They targeted the raw material producers of these drugs, as well as those that are producing and selling the final product. So with Bob being a part of this operation, he's going to tell us all about what went into it, what his role in it was, the operation that actually sparked Raw Deal, the process of identifying and following those targets, what those busts looked and felt like, and how many people were brought down over those 18 months. He will also tell us about his path to the DEA, how the DEA and the Taylor Hooten Foundation got connected during this time, and how he thinks we can combat this problem moving forward. By talking about this, we hope to make others aware of not only how dangerous these drugs are, but oftentimes how dangerous the process is of where they come from. So let's bring Bob into the show and learn more about the process of shutting down a steroid operation. Hey, Bob, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Wonderful, Brian. Thanks for uh, the invitation and the opportunity to be part of an All Me podcast. I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank you and the Hooten family and the Taylor Hooten Foundation. Uh, Wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, Wonderful information and resources that you guys are providing to uh, parents and teens on the dangers of uh, performance enhancing drugs. Just uh, wonderful work. Thank you for the kind words. That that means a lot. We, we, uh, That's what we're here for. That's our mission every day, but we also can't do it without people like you that come on board and believe in what we're doing and support us and share their stories. And that's why we're able to do this podcast. So it's a team effort. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time today, because I think today's episode is really going to be one that's, that's pretty unique. We've, we've done a lot of episodes now, but uh, this one's going to be different from others. It's funny. I say that because uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts outside of our own. And, and nowadays when you kind of, scroll through the top charts there's a lot of uh true crime let's put it like that right that seems to be popular and we don't really venture into that side of things but i think today's probably going to be as close as we get because uh we're going to spend most of our time talking about operation raw deal which i already gave our listeners a little bit of background on but uh, i want to take them into the world of that drug bust so that's what is true crime is we'll probably get on this podcast but it's going to be a little bit fascinating so i I do want to spend most of our time talking about what went into that, why it got started, what was the process behind all that. But before we get to that, I mean, obviously it makes sense to learn a little bit more about you. So let's let's start there. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Was being in this whole law enforcement DEA world something that you always wanted to do? What should we know about the, the early days of Bob? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, certainly. Well, concerning my upbringing, I was raised in the Midwest in a middle-class uh, Christian home environment wonderful family, uh, wonderful parents. During my senior year of high school, we had the opportunity to attend courses at a local junior college. So that was pretty neat. Two of my good friends and I attended a law enforcement class. And this class was, it was excellent. It was taught by a lieutenant and a sergeant of local police departments. And I, I, I think at that time and that age, as a senior, you're looking for people to talk to you openly and, and in a mature manner. And that's exactly what these guys did. Everybody in the class appreciated it. They brought in guest speakers that covered 
you know, local police departments, uh, federal agencies talking about their investigations, and it just provided uh, wonderful information and, and you know, great interest for me to go into law enforcement. In fact, after that class, of course, finishing completing high school and then going into uh, some of the junior college classes and on to college, uh, I, along with my two friends, went into uh, the law enforcement uh, profession. Uh, all three of us are now retired and uh, enjoying our families, but uh, each one of us would certainly say that as a result of attending this class, it, it definitely provided uh, an opportunity for us to see what law enforcement career would be like and just wanted to go down that road and, and we uh, all enjoyed wonderful careers. So it was a, a neat opportunity for us to attend a class at, at that time and at, at that age. Yeah, I think we can all somewhat connect with that, right? We go through life, especially at a younger age, right? It's hard to ask young people what they want to do with their lives. But I think what normally happens is you just find something that clicks, right? You find a passion or two, you run into somebody that's into something that you think, oh, that that sounds great. I, I can think back for me, like, uh, I, I kind of worked in the sports world for a while. I studied that in college. You know, the first time I kind of learned that I could work in that, even more so than just being a fan of that, I was like, well, let me let me explore this a little bit. And I think it's cool to know that, like, Hey, it was just this one person, this one day that I sat down and, and something kind of sparked an interest. And I decided I'm going to do that. And that's what you did. And you created a, a successful career within that. I mean, you worked your way all the way up to being a special agent with the DEA. So tell us a little bit about that career path. You started in what, just local law enforcement. And then just how'd you get into the DEA from there and, and work yourself up to being a special agent? Yeah, for me, it was a process. And, you know, I agree with you. I mean, I think I can definitely attribute, you know, my career uh, and the opportunities that I've had, you know, to both the lieutenant and the sergeant that taught this class, and then also a police officer who was uh, working in a city nearby uh, where I was working, who had become a DEA agent in Chicago. So thinking of those three people or gentlemen offered me an opportunity to see, you know, what their careers were like in their professions. And I was just totally excited by that. So I worked for, for 10 years. I was an officer and a detective uh, within a local police department and became a crime scene investigator, which was uh, pretty neat. But I really felt uh, that at that 10 year mark that I wanted to do and, and see more. So it was perfect timing, right? I mean, I met this agent who had been an officer nearby. He said, hey man, you know, DEA is a wonderful opportunity, very exciting, just opens up an entire world. I mean, you're working as a local police officer, which is great. And both of my friends, you know, they did that and completed a career locally. But what the DEA offered was just a nationwide and even an international uh, experience, which uh, links up to the Taylor Hooten Foundation, uh, as we'll see when we cover the investigation. So the opportunities were, for me, were far beyond, you know, what I had experienced at the local level. And it was an opportunity for me to, you know, expand, you know, my occupation uh, and my efforts and everything that I had learned at the local level and apply, you know, what I had learned there federally and just learn a, a new type and style of, of investigation, which I hadn't experienced before. Yeah, what I pull from that and what I'll tell anybody that life is all about timing, right? You just never know what opportunities yep. are come up at what time and you just came into the, you know, met this one person that had an opening here and, you know, took us into all this. I mean, time, yep. timing is so much of everything. I mean, timing, Honestly, it's the reason why you and I are even having this conversation, right? Before we even get into the drug bust themselves, which I want to I want to learn all about that and the details of what went into that. I want to talk about the timing and one of those things that actually sparked them to happen in the first place, right? Because we actually have uh, I'm just going to assume we have a decent amount of listeners here that may not recall this, but back when Taylor's situation and story first happened, uh, it became literally a national news story. It was much bigger than just, you know, sure. Plano, Texas. I mean, it was in the news. Obviously his dad testified at congressional hearings. It was in USA Today. It right. was literally, there were national pieces being out there. We were in documentaries. And so sometimes we forget that because it's been so many years now because of that, but because this was a national news story, it allowed obviously a lot of people to read and hear about Taylor's story. And one of those people that saw yeah. that, uh, was another DEA agent named Jack Robertson. He's actually a, a THF Legacy Award winner, one of our previous galas. So we've been connected with him for a while. But he saw this story, sparked an interest in getting the 
the DEA involved with like, okay, maybe there's a situation here on the anabolic steroids PED front that needs to be confronted, right? Tell us what you remember about this time, right? Because it, it's been a while, but do you remember that coming out as a national news story? Were you involved when these initial conversations first started to happen? Yeah, I, I do. And, you know, I'll break it down and, and tell the story as everything happened. You know, we go through different, uh, I would say, cycles of through our experience within the DEA, dangerous drugs that are popular at a certain time period, right? So you can, you know, think back to crack cocaine, cocaine, heroin. This time, definitely steroids were were in the news. And it, it as well, it would be the diversion, and I'll explain that a little bit, of pharmaceutical uh, drugs. So part of what DEA does, you know, it's the obvious, okay, we'll definitely investigate the uh, heroin and cocaine traffickers, but DEA is also uh, responsible for controlling pharmaceutical drugs. So the pharmaceutical industry, it, it, they're responsible for providing drugs you know, to people that have a legitimate medical need for those drugs. But along the way, people, doctors, could be people that work at a medical clinic, could take those drugs that are meant for people in helping them with a, a disease or a condition or pain, and they'll, they'll move those drugs onto the street. Sell them just like you would, you know, cocaine or heroin, and that in and of itself is illegal. So DEA has a responsibility of investigating those crimes as well. This time around 2006, 2007, when we were talking about being introduced to Special Agent uh, Robertson, uh, who was in San Diego at the time, it was just a wonderful opportunity for a connection because what we were seeing in Riverside, uh, California, which is where I was working at the time, that's about uh, 70 miles or so east of LA, a real increase in the diversion of these pharmaceutical drugs. So it wasn't typical that uh, an agent on the criminal side would partner up with a diversion investigator. And these investigators, they weren't in the sense um, of an investigator that you might think that carries a gun and a badge and executes search warrants. They helped in that endeavor but they did not uh, carry firearms. And they were more targeting, I guess it would be civil uh, investigations, not always criminal investigations. But in this time period, and, and of course, as we've seen you know, today with fentanyl, uh, we've moved those diversion investigations into more of a criminal uh, lane and mindset. And I was one of the first agents that moved over to this diversion group that allowed me the uh, advantage and opportunity to work these investigations uh, to a degree where they really hadn't been worked uh, before. And Jack Robertson and his team just did a wonderful job of investigating and providing leads to DEA offices throughout the nation, uh, as well as foreign offices, DEA offices internationally, uh, as we, we talk a little bit more about this. Uh, the operation that he began uh, just really expanded into an international investigation with uh, great success and great results. Yeah, the timing was right, right? Go back to that word. Like, it, we're starting to see yeah. an uptick in the illegal sale of this stuff. We, we, we're we seeing the behavior starting to creep up. On top of that, we're seeing Taylor's story come out. Like, we know this is happening. And so, yeah, all of this comes together with you, with Jack, with these teams. And it does. It sparks a couple of investigations, a couple of operations. The first operation, actually, before we get to Raw Deal, that we're going to spend probably the most time on, was uh, there's a precursor to that. It was called Operation Gear Grinder, which uh, was targeting anabolic steroids that I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, were being produced specifically in Mexico, right? We're being sold illegally in the U.S., but a lot of the raw actual drugs were being produced uh, across the border. And I say that because that was where Taylor was obtaining his stories, right? Being being in Texas, being right next to the border, that's where he got his hands. So again, the, the story all ties in there. But I believe that's what Operation Gear Grinder was all about. So I want to know a little bit more about that. Were you involved with that operation directly? And then give us a little bit of insight in what the results were at the end of that. Well, I wasn't involved directly with Gear Grinder, but oftentimes the way these operations will, will work and the success that you have with an operation will undoubtedly lead to an opportunity to conduct further investigations. And Jack Robertson and, and his team took full advantage of that. Uh, the information uh, that was gained during Gear Grinder 
you know, from the, the Mexican companies that were providing steroids and selling those across the, the border, uh, afforded opportunities and leads and investigative opportunities for other offices, uh, like our office in, in Riverside. So once an investigation starts, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to end right away. In fact, you know, some DEA investigations uh, can take years to conduct. So what happened was, is, is Jack and his team conducted this investigation and had wonderful success. And from that, they developed leads that said, hey, this is just beyond Mexico. This involves other targets. And I'll use that word target. And basically, it's a word for a bad guy, okay, for us investigating people who we believe are involved in the illegal sales of, of drugs or the manufacture of those drugs, uh, well beyond Mexico, in the United States, and in fact, in foreign countries as well. So Jack introduced uh, me, uh, along with many other investigators, to what they had gained uh, in terms of the success in lead information, intelligence information, I'll call it, uh, from Gear Grinder, so that we could expand upon that uh, even more to a to a deeper level and expand it way beyond Mexico in the United States and conduct additional investigations that were even larger than what they had experienced and had conducted with Mexico. With regard to Taylor's situation, it was determined that the steroids that Taylor had were had in fact come from companies and part of the investigation that uh, Jack and his team had conducted in Mexico. And it, it's not often that you can put that connection together. We'll conduct these investigations and we're always hopeful that we have, you know, a significant seizure and make the right connections uh, to the people or the companies that are producing it and, you know, ultimately charge them, uh, take them to court and, you know, have them, you know, serve prison time. Uh, you know, as well as monetary uh, fines as well. So we're always hopeful for that. And Jack was able to do that and as well make a direct connection to uh, Taylor Hooten and the situation there. Yeah, it's so crazy to me when I think back and I even read the the old articles about it, how much, you know, kind of Taylor's story weaves in and out of it. It's, it's kind of wild. And I also know that like, we're kind of trying to summarize these operations, you know, in a quick conversation. There's so much that goes into this and obviously it took a long time, but yeah, I, I, I did refreshed again on operation gear grinder and, and all the things they shut down in Mexico. And, and from what I was reading and reason why I kind of call it a precursor to a raw deal is that as you kind of alluded to what, what was found during that process was that a lot of the raw materials that were actually being used in Mexico, we're, we're not necessarily starting there, right? They were starting a right. lot, a lot coming from Asia, most coming from China, right? You, you locate, okay, there's a lot of raw materials coming in worldwide. Maybe the next step here is to target that, right? So correct me if I'm wrong again, but raw deal was the next step in the regards to, okay, we, we've located this stuff, how it's being sold, how it's getting here. We've just found out where it's coming from. We should probably go after the people. The next target, as you say, should probably be the people overseas that are producing the raw materials, the manufacturers, right? So was that the overall goal of Operation Raw Deal? And then, you know, specifically, what was your role within that? Yeah, exactly right. I would say that uh, this would be a, a, a phase of an investigation or an overall investigation. Certainly the names of the operations changed, but it was a, a natural next phase or next chapter for Operation Gear Grinder and the information that uh, was gained there that allowed us to initiate or allowed Jack and his team to initiate Operation Raw Deal. And it was an opportunity to track and trace further back to the source. DEA is charged with disrupt and dismantle. So I think we could say that Operation Gear Grinder disrupted a steroid, a clandestine steroid or an underground steroid operation. But what Raw Deal allowed us to do is to dismantle a steroid operation. So you're exactly right. What they had learned in Operation Gear Grinder with regard to the circumstances in Mexico was that the powdered steroids, many or really most of them were coming out of China. So the next natural logical step was to target China, target the people that were responsible for uh, having those drugs sent into the domestic United States, as well as other countries as well, 
uh, try to identify those people, which was not easy, uh, as we'll see when we move forward here, and you know, continue to investigate those people and hold those people and companies accountable for what they were doing. So just, a, I would say, a natural opportunity to take the uh, gear grinder operation one step further uh, towards uh, closure and, uh, and dismantling the, the operation internationally. Yeah, disrupt and dismantle. I like that phrase. I'm really starting to feel like I'm on a CSI episode now. Let's, let's keep keep the terminology coming. Out. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, but yeah, I think that all makes sense, right? Let's target the uh, the initial source of where a lot of this is coming from. And what I also think, uh, you know, reading through again, I remember when Raw Deal happened. It was obviously, such a big story, especially in relation to what we do every day. Uh, but you know, you found a lot of the raw materials, and you also found a lot of people here in the U.S. that were taking those raw materials, producing those drugs illegally, selling them as well, right? Creating these underground steroid labs is kind of maybe the best way to put it, right? And so that's where I want to spend the next few minutes actually talking about that process of, you know, what it would be to dismantle some of that kind of stuff, right? So let's talk about the process of what goes into shutting down an underground steroid lab, right? Let's say it's just somebody here in the U.S. that is illegally producing this stuff in their basement, getting the raw materials from China, all right? So what's the first step with that? How do you first learn about, there? okay, there might be someone that's doing this. There might be someone here or there that's operating one of these labs. Where does that initial information come from? Like, okay, we've got a potential target here. Yeah, uh, I'll walk you through this, and I'll tell you, for me, this was uh, an exciting time. I had never completed, uh, conducted an investigation like this before. Uh, I think many of my colleagues, uh, in fact, this was the first time that they had conducted an investigation uh, of this type. And the reason I say that is because everything was on the internet. Everything that we targeted, everything that we learned, the, the, the leads that were developed by Jack involved people hiding on the internet, acting as legitimate companies, uh, when in fact they weren't. I mean, we'll call them, you know, rogue companies, uh, if you will, uh, clandestine manufacturer of steroids. But what the internet enables you to do, and, you know, especially even more so back in 2006 and 2007, we've certainly made advances, you know, from an investigative standpoint, certainly federally, to do a better job of tracking through the internet uh, to discover who people are and uh, hiding uh, on the internet in many different uh, aspects of criminal behavior. I hadn't had the experience of that before. So uh, Jack and his team afforded us an opportunity to conduct an investigation like this and along the way, become educated on, on how we could do this. And we were so hopeful that we would have success, but you know, this was the first time I had, I had done anything like this. So what it required for us is to operate uh, undercover on the internet, act as a customer, which I did, and communicate with uh, a company on the internet and purchase steroids from that company. I did not know where they were located, other than we were very, very suspicious and hopeful that it was with the Los Angeles uh, County, Riverside County areas where we believed that these steroids were coming from. And that's exactly what Jack did is break down geographically within the United States and the lead and the teams that he developed there to provide this information to areas uh, where they believed the steroids were coming from and then allowed us to further target, closely target and try to monitor these, uh, these companies because it was beyond San Diego where Jack was. So it was just too, really too much for the San Diego office to handle and really brought in an international phase as we mentioned you know, for raw deal. Uh, what it forced me to do is learn more about uh, tracking people uh, via the internet, uh, tracking money uh, as we purchased these steroids on the internet. Uh, we had successful purchases, successful communication, which was all saved. So although I wasn't talking to, you know, the individual or the persons involved in this particular company, uh, I was communicating with them, uh, emails. Uh, typically on a, a blog situation as well, especially for steroids. And even today, the blogs are a big, big deal. Uh, and that was a way for people to share information. Uh, people who were customers of these steroid purchases, and they wanted to see successful results from taking the steroids. 
So we always talk about the dangers of, of these drugs, and certainly these were dangerous when you take into account that these drugs, these powdered steroids, were being manufactured in these underground labs uh, without any oversight. I mean, typically you think of, you know, the FDA or the EPA that would, uh, you know, oversee companies that are producing, you know, pharmaceuticals. And in this case, there was none of that. So you have these powders being, you know, made into liquids, placed into vials, then sold over the internet and people injecting this steroid liquid uh, into their bodies. I mean, just outrageously dangerous. So uh, definitely the motivation was there, uh, but there was some anxiety along the way because this was so much different than what DEA and in a DEA investigation typically would do in the past. We would always want to investigate and put a name, a location, a face, identify who our target is, right? We want to know who that person is before we go out there and buy those drugs. Uh, and some of the stuff, I mean, you see on, on TV, some of, some of it is a, is a reach, but certainly everybody can picture in their mind, you know, an undercover copper agent, you know, conducting a meeting, could be in a parking lot, could be in a restaurant, wherever it is, and having that meeting take place and the exchange of drugs and money and then that person goes along, you know, the way. And DEA and local law enforcement agency and our partners are charged with further identifying who that person is, where they go, where they take their money. And that ultimately leads to, you know, a search warrant, arrest warrant, hopefully, and their arrest for dealing those drugs. In this case, the meeting was over the Internet. There's no real potential for surveillance, right? We didn't know who this person was. I mean, they were just a company name, the sales went through Western Union. And there's a coded aspect to that as well. So the money exchanged hands and code words exchanged hands between me as an undercover customer, we'll say, and the company, whoever the company was and whoever was behind the company in order to complete those sales. So that was very successful, but you know, certainly along the way frustrating because all I had was a company name, which I knew full well was false. Uh, we're always trying to investigate as much as we can behind the scenes, but there wasn't a great deal of information uh, available other than when you get down to an internet investigation, you're talking about domain names, addresses, and IP addresses, right. which was really the key here for our investigation and my investigation that uh, hopefully would result in identifying who was behind this company. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that makes this so fascinating. Uh, not only was it really the largest bust of its kind, initiative of its kind when it comes to this category of drugs, but like you said, the process is completely different because, you know, I, I think a lot of people probably do assume, and that's, a, as you alluded to, mostly because of what they watch on TV, that probably, well, we uh, set up a meeting, we strapped a wire to them, like we caught them red-handed, and no, it was so much internet base and the internet is always one of those things I, I say is such a double-edged sword right because the internet does some wonderful right. things it's allowing you and i to record this conversation right now right it allows you to track these people but at the same time you're tracking illegal behavior that's happening because of the internet right so there's so much dichotomy when it comes to that but i'm sure it did put you in an interesting situation and then i'm, I'm kind of curious how long does that process take right so let's say you found a, a website that's you assume is illegally selling the stuff you buy it you take a look at it and then you're going to continue to monitor that quote unquote company's behavior how long are you doing that for how much information do you need to obtain before we get to bus day which we'll get to next but i'm curious how, how, mu how much time goes into this and how much do you need to compile before you have enough to say all right we're, we're going to this behavior this spot we think this is where they're at yeah, exactly. I, I mean, sometimes, you know, investigations can be, you know, quick within, you know, weeks or months. DEA is charged, you know, with investigating larger drug trafficking organizations. So typically, it's going to take a, a DEA investigation a little bit more time getting back to the disrupt and dismantle because, you know, much of what we want to do is identify all the participants involved in the crime. Uh, and that word conspiracy, there's going to be other people that maybe you don't identify immediately within your investigation. So you want to, what we'll say is you want to follow that person, but you also want to follow the money. And, you know, that takes time. That takes subpoenas and other search warrants along the way. 
uh, along with undercover purchases. So it, it, it's a process for the Operation Raw deal. As I recall, it took about uh, seven months for me to complete my investigation. And along the way, you know, you have frustrations, you have successes. Uh, you have, you know, some failures, you know, where you figure, oh, wow, you know, now I've developed this lead or this information that can tell me exactly where this person is. And this is exactly what happened. I found a location and I'm like, okay, this is where I believe this guy is operating out of. Got in my car, traveled into LA, you know, about an hour, drove to the location and it was nothing but a vacant lot. So certainly disappointing for me when I thought that the information that I had at that time was was enough for me to at least identify, you know, a building, you know, a, a residence, a house, something that would allow me to conduct surveillance. And lo and behold, it was just a, a dirt lot. Yeah, I'm sure that's frustrating. But, uh, you know, you, you pull out enough strings, one of them, you hope and you, you catch them at the end. And that's where, where I'm curious on the last step of this is like, right? Because because this investigation is so different that you're doing it through the Internet and you're almost flying blind just a little bit. Uh, I imagine when that yeah. day came to do, you know, the actual drug bust, it had to be completely different, right? So walk us through that. Let's say you've got enough information when you feel confident, you know, comfortable, confident that, all right, we've we we've found something here, right? We're going to go into this building. We're going to bust this person. What's running through your head that day? Because you, as you kind of said already, you don't even know who you're looking for or what they look like. So I got to imagine that's a little bit nerve wracking, let alone wondering if you're in the right spot to begin with. So what is what does bus day look like both physically and emotionally, so to speak? Yeah, you know, and I'll, I'll walk you through this. Certainly, you know, not only was this type of investigation new for me, but it was new for the prosecutors. And uh, beyond that, it was new for the judge. So what I was able to do with the success of my undercover purchases and the success, I'll say, of tracking back through the computer and the Internet to show the judge where I believe that this person was operating, I developed enough, what you've heard, probable cause, information enough for me to put that into words, into a search warrant, and to take that in front of a judge and say, this is exactly what I believe is going on you know, at this location. And I believe that there's a clandestine or an underground steroid laboratory at this location. So that type of thing, you know, results in a sit down meeting in the office of the, the judge and, uh, you know, explaining to the judge the investigation of what is what is actually going on here. What did I do to conduct and gain this information at this time? Enough probable cause to lead me to this point where I'm saying, hey, I have enough information here where we can execute a search warrant at a location and i believe that there's enough probable cause here uh, that we will find an underground or a clandestine uh, laboratory clandestine laboratory at this location once you have that information and you show this information read this information along you know with the judge uh, i was very fortunate to have the judge find that there was enough probable cause and issue a search warrant we go into a preparation phase and for me, that was meeting with local law enforcement agencies that uh, I worked with in the past and explain to them what I had been doing, explain the investigation, where I believe these locations were, and have them help me execute these search warrants, uh, which were all executed very, very early in the morning uh, at various locations, and do so as safely as we, as we could. And I, I recall the anxiety there because... Typically, as I had mentioned, you know, DEA would would know who the, the target is. Here I'm talking with uh, investigators, uh, detectives, and ultimately SWAT teams who executed the, the search warrants uh, for our investigation out of Riverside to say, I wish I knew more. I have enough probable cause to enter this residence, this location, but I don't know anything more than that. Uh, which was the one main reason for using SWAT teams, you know, for the execution of these warrants at the time, because there was an uncertainty as to what we would find beyond that door. Uh, and certainly, you know, relatively dangerous situation at, at that point, not having any more information other than what we knew at the time, uh, just coming off of the Internet and I would say IP addresses. 
Yeah. I just got to imagine that there's got to be a little bit of fear there, right? Like, oh my gosh, like I, I hope I'm in the right spot. I hope I got the right person here. You feel good about it based on all the, everything you've accumulated, but still that's got to run through your head a little bit, but here, here's the good news. Uh, it did work, right? Like, I mean, even though this, the tactics were different than you have before and, and using this, a lot of internet base was something that was kind of new. Uh, I, I would say overall, I mean, Raw Deal was pretty successful in regards to what, what its end goals were. I mean, if we look at this, it was what, like an 18-month whole operation. I was kind of refreshing myself on the numbers. There was 56 underground labs that were shut down. And, and I say labs in the loosest term that you possibly can, right? But production facilities, right. so you can call them that. 124 different arrests, and not just in California. I mean, it was 27 states. It was all across the country. There was 37 different factories over in China that were identified as supplying those raw materials that were going into the, all those arrests in states. So there was a lot that came out of this. There was a lot that was shut down. Even to this day, it's the biggest, you know, steroid crackdown that, that we've had yet. Right. And so I, I, knowing all those numbers and knowing how much happened as a result of this, were you surprised in how, you know, big this problem was and how expansive this problem was? Did you expect to find all this when you started this whole thing? Well, you know, working with Jack and his team and the leads that they had developed and, and the intelligence information, we were certain that we were investigating, you know, potential targets that, that had uh, opportunities to sell these steroids, these powdered steroids, and, you know, ultimately the, the liquid vials, uh, at, you know, at, in great quantities. I, I don't think that there was a doubt that that was, was out there. Certainly with regard to how this investigation and how these investigations worked, where you really didn't know the identity of, of these persons until you executed the, the search warrant, there was some apprehension there. With regard to the Riverside investigation, the locations that I had developed were in fact locations where sales had taken place. But my particular target was mobile. He was moving around. So although I had identified a location where a sale may have transpired, and certainly, you know, this, my undercover sale may have transpired at that location, you know, the overall goal is, you know, where is the clandestine laboratory? Where is the underground lab? That is, that's the key. That's our focus. And that's what we need to find. So there's definitely anxiety. There's excitement uh, that day. I mean, I can think back to that moment right now. And I was at a, a different location from this residential location where a, a local SWAT team executed the search warrant. And I'll never forget the phone call. My phone rang. Uh, I was at, a, I said, another search warrant. And the sergeant of the SWAT team called me. And he said, Bob, you've got to get over to my location immediately. You've got to get over here now. And I said, okay, what did you find? And he, he said, look, I'll just explain it to you when you get here, but you need to head over right now. And it was, uh, it was amazing. I mean, it was uh, a jackpot of, uh, of execution of a search warrant. Immediately when the SWAT team hit this particular residence, they were met with an individual. There were three individuals in the residence uh, at that time, but out in the open, uh, long guns, automatic weapons, ammunition, boxes, powdered steroids, kilos of powdered steroids, completed vials of, of steroids ready to be sold, uh, what we call an indicia of sale. So, you know, there was mailing packages, there were labels, uh, there was a, an indoor marijuana grow. In the backyard, there was a, a DVD VHS pirated, I would say, you know, company operation for Hollywood movies. The second that SWAT team hit, hit that location and they did so safely, they were met with uh, unbelievable uh, information and, you know, further invest, investigative opportunities there with uh, everything that was in the house. And what, well, I'll say the underground laboratory was uh, being manufactured right in the kitchen of the residence. That's where the powdered steroids are being converted into the liquid steroids and then placed within the vials. And then the whole home essentially was a sales operation for the company. So, you know, in terms of picturing, uh, you know, a brick and mortar, you know, company, uh, you know, with a sign out front, I mean, there was none of that. 
everything was contained within this residence uh, where they received the powdered steroids from China, ultimately converted them into liquids, and then sold them via the internet uh, domestically in the United States as if they were a legitimate company. Yeah, and I'll put a few uh, pictures in the show notes of what some of these busts kind of look like just to give everyone a visual on, on what you're walking them through right now. But yeah, those are the kind of places that you found. You found them all over the country. Uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn that a lot of times it's, you know, quiet suburban neighborhoods that had this kind of stuff. I mean, as you said, pretty unsanitary environments, bathrooms, kitchens, right? Again, the, that's why I use the word lab pretty loosely. I, I don't know that you'd call it that once you see the pictures, but those are the kind of situations that were uncovered through this operation uh, and, and maybe way more of them than people were, you know, expecting going in. But uh, the stuff is out there, right? I mean, I even today, I we're talking through all this and it's so fresh in my mind because this is still going on. This is the process that we walk people through in our education programs. Even today, we were doing it back when all of this happened. We're still doing it now because people are surprised to learn that this is happening. Even if listeners are surprised to learn how many busts came out of this and all of this, I, I'm not necessarily super surprised because I know that it exists. Obviously, I live in the problem every day, but this is still going on. These are the kind of conditions they're being made. In. And I'm curious, I, I know you're retired now, but from my end, knowing that this process is, is still going on, I mean, there was an amazing dent put into it through these operations, right? Uh, and, and opened up a lot of yeah. eyes. But do you know this? I mean, are these labs that you just described in great detail uh, that are still out there, right? Who knows to exactly what extent, but they still exist. You know, are they still a focus of the DEA? And just in your opinion, having gone through this like you did, how prevalent do you think they, they still are today? Well, you know, they're, they will adapt and overcome you know, as we say. So certainly we definitely hit them very hard with uh, Gear Grinder and with Raw Deal, uh, but they have the opportunity, they being criminal organizations, to gather themselves and to try to do better uh, in a way to hide what, what they're doing. So this, this type of investigation with Gear Grinder and involving uh, China and what, what I'll call these remailers to hide you know, over the internet and conduct their sales was a new opportunity for these criminal organizations. They realized they had the opportunity and the freedom to, uh, you know, take this to a different level where you didn't have to meet in person. You could do everything behind closed doors, so to speak, and do it on the internet. Uh, so how amazing, I, I know my particular uh, target was shocked. I could just tell, you know, by the manner in which uh, they held themselves they had no idea that they were being investigated. So that definitely gives you, you know, a, a, a sense of completion, you know, that you've done the right thing. Uh, instantly, I was overwhelmed with what I saw in the residence. I mean, that was a 24 hour day where I had to call in a uh, hazardous material team, the ATF, other investigators. And I think to this day, it, it stands as one of the largest clandestine or underground labs in Los Angeles County. So, I mean, it goes to show you with that freedom that they had, the extent, you know, to which they could conduct themselves uh, as a sale, illegal sales operation. So moving forward to today, you know, we move on to fentanyl. We move on to, you know, other steroids. We move on to other synthetic drugs where, in fact, uh, yeah, they continue to, you know, to make these drugs in clandestine or underground operations, you know, even larger than what I experienced in 2006 and 2007. And I would say that, you know, federally we've ramped up those investigations. Many, many more people are conducting investigations, you know, on the internet. Now you have the, you know, the advent of the dark web. Certainly the dark web has been around for a while, uh, but we are conducting investigations there, you know, and in, in the open uh, internet as well. So that's a new, I, I think, investigative phase an opportunity for federal investigations, uh, federal investigators. And, you know, thinking back to raw deal and gear grinder, you know, to those, those days and those times was the opportunity for us to begin that type of investigation that uh, has expanded, I would say, easily tenfold to what we're experiencing today. So certainly it's always steroids, but there's always going to be other synthetic drugs that are made along the way uh, in this manner domestically and uh, in foreign operations. DEA does a wonderful job. I, you know, we have, I think, offices in 
60 plus, 70 plus foreign countries, uh, because not all these foreign countries have the same abilities and investigative uh, opportunities. So we want to help them and provide them with uh, leads and training. So certainly a criminal organization could look for a, a location or a place like that where they don't think that they're going to have the type of uh, American or United States law enforcement targeting them. We will help these countries in an effort to uh, target these criminal organizations where they think they might be able to operate rather rather safely. Yeah, I got to imagine it's pretty cool to look back and know that the investigative techniques that y'all used in those operations kind of sparked a, a whole new world when it comes to this and how you tackle these issues and how you go after these targets, right? And yes, I, you're right. I, I, I know the DEA is still looking at this and I know it still remains a problem, you know, to what prevalence it's, it's hard to say how, how often it's going on. But obviously, I, I know that this kind of illegal behavior is still out there. I don't know that it ever goes away. That's part of why the DEA exists, right? To continue to tackle this stuff. But I, I can personally say that there are still internet shell companies directly selling this stuff to our young people. I mean, don't get me wrong. Operation Raw Deal Gear, Gear sure. made a tremendous dent in this problem. And I think even talking about this right now only helps with that and the, and the impact that that, that did. Um, and it's really is amazing to think how much of that even was sparked by Taylor's story. But moving forward from there, knowing that this stuff is, is still happening, these drugs are still being sold, people are still making this stuff, and even knowing that the DEA is still tackling this as best as they can, what, what else do you think we can do here? How else can we, maybe if we're not preventing the illegal behavior from happening, how can we maybe prevent people from buying those things in the first place, right? I mean, do you think do you think education is something that can help? I mean, I'm of the opinion that even you and I having this conversation right now has got to be helping with the problem, right? Just talking about it more can make another dent on top of the dent that y'all did through these operations. What what are the, what are the next steps you think are out there to continue to tackle this stuff? Well, you're exactly right. And communication is key. And what I would say now is, I mean, it's communication not only amongst law enforcement but i mean we have to expand that right i mean we have to talk to our healthcare professionals we have to talk to other investigators we have to talk to parents we have to talk to coalitions it just can't be and we you know used this uh jargon or you know term before the thin blue line we have to work together as a team with regard to this enforcement opportunity Certainly Operation Raw Deal, you know, and even the instance of, of being just overwhelmed instantly by what we discovered, you know, at a search warrant site, you know, allowed for, you know, the, the local officers to see this and an education, as we'll say, for other law enforcement agencies to realize, wow, there's, this is a big deal. This is a problem where we need to become involved. You know, how can we also conduct investigations? We need to take a look at this, you know, locally with our youth, you know, and our our athletes, you know, are they exposed to uh, steroids and to drugs where before maybe we didn't realize that that problem was there. So I tell you, it just runs not only, you know, through the law enforcement community, but just right down to the family level with regard to communication and education as being the key you know, for what we do. I was called to Canada and I talked about this investigation to Canadian authorities to help them conduct investigations like this in Canada, where they hadn't had the opportunity to complete uh, undercover internet investigations like this. So, I mean, you talk about at the law enforcement level, expanding and making law enforcement officials better at what they do, and providing them with the resources and the tools to conduct these investigations. Then you break down all the way, you know, to educators, to coalitions, to family members, to simply put, I've talked, you know, to law enforcement in Canada, and I've talked to little league sports teams about what the dangers of performance enhancing drugs are, where they come from. And when you expand again, we were talking about that word laboratory, in no way is this a, a lab environment. This is a, an insanely dangerous um, manufacture of a, of a drug that people are putting into their body that is just absolutely unreal. So you take that to the level, you know, where you're talking to uh, a, an athlete and say, you, you have to say no. 
the instance that somebody may come to you and say, hey, this can make you bigger, this can make you faster. This is not what you want to be doing. There are many other opportunities for you, you know, to proceed, uh, you know, as an athlete, you know, if we can focus on, on that for a moment, uh, to where you communicate with your coaches and your parents and say, okay, what opportunities do I have other than what I'm seeing coming at me from maybe a locker room setting or a best friend setting, you know, where somebody says, hey, you should try this. This is going to make you bigger, better, faster. When you realize, hey, this is, this is a very bad thing, how we can communicate that to a parent or to a trusted adult to say, hey, somebody's going to have to take a look at this because this is, you know, coming at, you know, my particular athlete or our team and somebody is trying to sell the, these drugs uh, illegally and trying to introduce it, you know, at uh, an athletic youth level that's just uh, completely unacceptable. So overall, education, communication, a, a, a big deal. And we all have to share, in, you know, in that effort from law enforcement, you know, all the way down to uh, local communities and uh, our families. I'm 100% with you. I mean, I love that we get to wrap with one of my favorite buzzwords, and that's just simply education. I just think it's the most cost efficient, time efficient way to tackle so much of this stuff, right? Like, even if we can never fully 100% shut down the illegal production and selling of this stuff, right? That's going to be hard to prevent all of that from happening. I do think what we can do is what we're doing right now is have conversation, is talk about this stuff, make people aware that the problem exists. That's got to be the most logical starting point for a lot of this stuff so that if and when someone is faced with the temptation of purchasing this stuff, well, they know a little bit more about what it is. They know a little bit more about what the dangers are. They know a little bit more about where it came from. All of that plays into a really important education you know, initiative that in my mind is what leads to prevention. Yeah, and I've always said that education equals prevention. And so I, I want to thank you on a couple fronts. I want to thank you, number one, for just doing the work that you did with law enforcement and DEA. I mean, the, the impact that y'all made really can't even be put into those numbers that I said. I mean, we could talk about all that, that all we want, but I more so look at it like, okay, yes, y'all shut down X number of labs and X number of rests. I look at it like, think about the number of people that didn't get those drugs because of y'all, the hands that that stuff didn't make it into because of that. That's how I look at it. So I thank you for that. And then I thank you for spending the time today, continuing to talk about it, right? Because there are going to be some people that listen to this that may not know anything about those operations and may not even really have an understanding of where this is coming from in the first place. So just you and I having this conversation is going to continue to get people thinking about this, continue talking about it and lead to that education that prevents so much in the first place. So thank you for both of those things. Thank you for spending some time. It was fascinating for me to listen through it and, and learn a little bit more about the process. I know others as well though. So thanks for all you're doing and, and thanks for, uh, allowing me to, to dive into you, pick your brain a little bit on all this as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. And, and this opportunity and, and again, the All Me podcast here is just a, a, a perfect example and reminder of what can be done, you know, with regard to Taylor's story, connecting with law enforcement, and then taking it to that next level where we educate and tell a story where we're able to, to save the life of another young person. And I don't think there's anything that uh, is, is more, uh, I, I think, forceful in a way where we can share this story one-on-one, -on -one, you know, at a level where we can say, this is the reality of what can happen. And this is what law enforcement is doing. But at the same time, this is what we can do at a, a local level to help prevent this. And to partner together to do this uh, is an amazing opportunity. I, I wanna thank you for uh, the ability to be part of the podcast and continue to get this information out there uh, to other people to share the story. It's very important. Well, thanks again for the kind words, Bob. I've always said this about what we do and, and even this podcast. I think the goal is to, to have conversations that lead to further conversations. And I, I really do think we did that today. So thanks for giving us that conversation. Thanks again for your time. And, and I hope to do it again soon. Wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.